Good morning, everybody. Good morning. And a special warm welcome to Reverend Michael Roberts, who is here to lead communion with us this morning. I'm not sure where the vicar is, so don't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> Take a seat and we'll have the notices first, please. <clears throat> I haven't said welcome to all joining us from home, but welcome. It's good that you can be with us. Um, this evening we have a service of evening prayer at 6.30. Next week we'll have all age worship with a baptism led by Reverend Paul at 11 and evening prayer at 6.30. On Tuesday evening, at 7.30 we have a Lent, the Lent Bible study at Jonathan and Sarah's. If you haven't already come to that and would like to, Jonathan and Sarah are with us this morning. Okay. <laughs> um, and also on Tuesday we have a Lent lunch. We started um, on Friday with a Lent lunch at Alison's. On Tuesday, this coming week, it is at uh, Linda's house. Please. Linda's with us. If you're not sure where she lives, she'll tell you. Six and Tams Avenue, Thorn Meadows. Thank you. And that will be at one o'clock. Did you get that? Six and Tams Avenue. In what we just refer to as the new houses. <laughs> That's where we are. Okay. Uh, advance notice for the 22nd of March, well, the week from 22nd of March, we have the charity shop in Poulton. There is a list at the back of church for those who want to volunteer to man the stalls there um, on a you know, come-as-you-will basis. And if you have any goods that are suitable for for selling in the charity shop, you know, fancy goods, clothes, tools, children's toys, whatever, please either bring them to church or let, um, I think it's Alison. Kathy, you involved in that as well? Yes, yeah. collecting things? I mean, knowing that people have brought things, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Kath, thank you. Okay. Um, <coughs> Those, I think, are all the notices Kath, for now. Yes? Mother's Union on Wednesday morning at 11 o'clock here. Mother's Union, Wednesday morning, 11 o'clock here. Okay, thank you. Um, so our service begins with a verse of scripture. Jesus said, What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? Please stand and we'll sing hymn number 77, Christ Triumphant Ever Reigning.
<clears throat> and so we take our red service booklets and we're on page one. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. And turning the page, we pray together. Please sit or kneel for prayer. <coughs> We say together, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, the first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Lord, have mercy. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. As we say together, the first of the prayers on page three. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs> And together we say the Gloria. Glory. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. And the collect for the second Sunday of Lent. Almighty God, you show to those who are in error the light of your truth, that they may return to the way of righteousness. Grant to all those who are admitted into the fellowship of Christ's religion, that they may reject those things that are contrary to their profession, and follow all such things as are agreeable to the same. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And could we have our first reading, please, Cindy? <clears throat> the 
first reading is taken from Genesis 17, verses 1 to 7, and Genesis 15, verse 16. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the Almighty God. Obey me and always do what is right. I will make my covenant with you and give you many descendants. Abram bowed down with his face touching the ground, and God said, I make this covenant with you. I promise that you will be the ancestor of many nations. Your name will no longer be Abram, but Abraham, because I am making you the ancestor of many nations. I will give you many descendants, and some of them will be kings. You will have so many descendants that they will become nations. I will keep my promise to you and your descendants in future generations as an everlasting covenant. I will be your God and the God of your descendants. It will be four generations before your descendants come back here because I will not drive out the Amorites until they become so wicked that they must be punished. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And we stand to sing hymn number 37, after which Michael will bring us the gospel and the sermon. Glory to you, O Lord. Then Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. 
but turning and looking at his disciples. Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake, and for my sake, and for the sake of the gospel, will save it. For what shall it profit to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Now I speak in the name of the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 All those who have walked any distance with a heavy rucksack will know what I am talking about. And by heavy, I mean somewhere between 50 and 100 pounds. And if you were in the forces, you would be nearer the 100. And you've been plodding along, feeling the weight of your rucksack. And then you stop for a rest, you take off your rucksack and you start walking around. And it feels extremely odd. It feels as if you're walking on air. You can jump up to great heights and everything else. <coughs> Carrying a rucksack weighs you down, slows you down, and you cannot be as agile as normal. As a teenager, I carried a heavy rucksack 17 miles up the Glen Nevis from Fort William. It was quite tiring. Or, when I was in South Africa, I was lucky to spend 10 days on a hike through the Drakensberg Mountains. We started off 3,000 foot, and so carried our rucksacks a mere 4,000 foot up to the 7,000 foot level where we spent a few days. And then we went up to the summits between 10 and 11,000 feet, and that meant a climb of over 3,000 feet, more than the height of Scorfell, with a heavy rucksack on. And you could say that we often longed to have a light day rucksack with not much in it. Well, I think taking a rucksack on your back and backpacking is a bit like taking up your cross. You feel rather slow down, it is heavy and it's tiring. Because, in fact, the Christian life is much more like having a heavy rucksack on your back than a very light one. It has to be said that those who want an evening, easy Christian life will find that actually that doesn't exist because there is always something which will bring difficulties to us and can weigh us down. And too often, Christianity is presented as something easy and nice, and that is totally false. And at times, the church proclaims that it's nice and easy to be a Christian because they want to encourage new people to believe in Jesus Christ. So they'll emphasize the fun, the games, the music, the friendship, etc. rather than the faith in Jesus Christ. Yes, the message can be very easy, always just love, but rather a cosy love where people are sort of nice to each other except behind their backs. And if we think about um, that, we can think of what love is. We can think of um, a poem by C.S. Lewis where he has the lines, love is as hard as nails, thick, blunt, hammered through, 
pointing out love is not something cosy, but actually it's very hard and costly, and particularly as we see it in Christ on the cross. So I think this whole section from this Gospel is not for you if you want a nice, comfortable, cosy, easy Christianity. Uh, you better look elsewhere and you won't find it in the Gospels. Now this passage, I think, is one of the most important in the New Testament. Because in fact, the bits on either side, it gives you the centre of the Gospels. And if you look at the three Gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke, you find this, it's absolutely central. It's a turning point, or in contemporary terms, the pivot of the Gospel. And so it can move from Jesus being the teacher to Jesus being the Redeemer. Just before this, the disciples were in Caesarea Philippi, right on the Lebanon border. And there Jesus was asking his disciples, who do everybody say I am? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah or the prophet. He said, now who do you actually say I am? And Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he was commended for that. And then after that, he upset the apple cart by speaking of his death and resurrection. Where Peter <coughs> issue with him, having got a lovely statement, get behind his statement, Satan. And then was speaking to them about taking up the cross. And then having had this, which is quite hard, we go to something much more transfiguring and dramatic and delightful in the transfiguration of Jesus up one of the mountains in Israel. And I suggest it is Mount Hermon and not some little bump about the size of this hill where this church is. And there the disciples saw Jesus transfigured before them, almost a foretaste of the resurrection. So let us consider this passage. It begins, Then Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering, be killed, and after three days rise again. We just sort of take that for granted and feel, well, it's a straightforward, isn't it? It's just leading up to Easter. It wasn't then when the disciples heard it. It was absolutely shocking and horrific and completely against what they hoped for. Because there they found this person who was their teacher, their rabbi, their master. And then suddenly to have him turning around and say, actually, I will, well, you won't have me for much longer. I'm going to be arrested beaten up, executed, and he didn't mention the cross, but he it's implied. And that was too much for the disciples. And so, as the disciples were, let's say, almost silenced, not so Peter, who was one of his great skills, was always putting his foot in it and saying what was not quite appropriate, he just said to Jesus that that shouldn't happen to him. And there, Jesus had to rebuke him and came out with those famous words, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind on divine things, not on divine things, but human things. And perhaps too often, we do things and have attitudes about our faith in Christ where well, we would actually call upon that review, rebuke from Jesus. Get behind me, Satan. And then he called together all, his, all the disciples and also the crowd with him, because there were always the group of 12 disciples plus various others as well. It could be quite a large number. And sometimes he dealt just with the disciples, sometimes with the whole crowd or in the transfiguration just with three disciples. And so what did he say to them? If anyone to, one wants to be my follower, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Well, we may think, well that seems a bit odd because this is said several months before Jesus was crucified. Well it's not so odd when you consider that crucifixion was the standard 
nasty execution the Romans used, and they selected it for people they particularly did not like and who were a nuisance to them. And so most of the crowd would have seen some poor person condemned to death having to carry his heavy wooden cross to the place where he'd be executed. Not a pleasant sight. And if we go forward 40 years to the sack of Jerusalem in AD 70 by the Roman legions, in the course of the siege, many hundreds of Jews were crucified outside the walls of Jerusalem. And just imagine what that was like. So they knew what carrying your cross meant. <coughs> and so we can go back to that rock sack I spoke at the beginning. Not a tiny one, but a great big one. And that can weigh you down. And perhaps it's a good reminder that our faith is not something which is always easy. Being a Christian may give you great joy, but at times it can be very difficult, and particularly when you have to stand up for what is right against hostility, and the hostility may be physical or it may simply be verbal. And so he gives a warning. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of their gospel will save it. But there's an important paradox there. We can lose everything if we don't stand for what we believe in. And that applies to everything in life, and particularly in our Christian faith. And so if we claim to be Christian, and don't stand up for our faith when we need to, we in fact lose everything we have, or as Jesus says, we we'll lose our lives. And then he goes on to warn us of the danger of being ashamed of Jesus. And that is a temptation all of us can face. We can easily have it that we may not like some of the opposition we can get because we are a Christian. And so we will almost deny Christ, either by saying nothing or just simply walking away. And a little incident about this happened over 70 years ago in a parish in Nottingham, where a friend of mine was vicar in a mining village. And he had a member of the choir who was a miner. And this miner came to him one day and said, Basil, I'm going to leave the choir. I'm not going to come to church again. And Basil inquired why. And the miner said, I get so much mockery in the mine because I go to church. I just can't face going again. And I think when you know the mockery people can get, you can understand why. And so we need to avoid the fact that we can easily deny Christ by simply hiding our light under a bushel and ultimately being ashamed of Christ, something we need to avoid. And I don't think there is an easy answer there. Well, I think this passage contains a certain amount of hard and difficult teaching and not the nice, cosy stuff which many people might like. Being a Christian is not an easy option. And I think the picture of taking up your cross sums it up in an enormous heavy wooden beam which somehow you have to struggle along and carry ten times worse than carrying an overloaded rucksack. And so at times our faith can be one of effort and grind <coughs> and difficulty rather than simply something nice and comfortable. Maybe that's something we can take away with us. But what about us? What do we do? When we find the difficult things in the Christian faith, are we like Peter, 
and simply object and try to find a softer, softer option. I think so often we do fall into that because so often we want a cosy Christianity and a cosy Christianity is not Christianity. Or do we focus on what happened to Jesus, thinking what what he said and what he would undergo, his suffering, his death on the cross, and then of course his resurrection. If we focus there, then we will see that if we are going to follow Jesus, we need to take up his cross, and at times that can be difficult. Amen. 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 Let's stand and say together the nice thing. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, True God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for all those good things that are in our world and in our lives through your love. Save us from being ungrateful or taking your blessings for granted. Save us from magnifying our sorrows and forgetting our blessings. Strengthen us, Lord, by your Holy Spirit so that our hearts are thankful and joyful. By your help, may we learn to live as those should who have trusted in your promises and who know that in the end, love will conquer all things. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, we come to you in faith to ask for your ways of peace to prevail in our world. Please teach mankind to live together in peace. No person or nation exploiting the weak. No person or nation hating the strong. Each person and nation working out their own destiny without fear, treating others with respect. We hold before you this morning the people of Ukraine and Russia, Israel and Gaza, Yemen, other areas around your world where there is war, oppression and violence. Take away prejudice. Take away fear. Teach all mankind to give others the honour they deserve, whatever their nationality or race, or their religion, or their politics. And Father, we pray for your blessing upon our royal family. At present, they face many challenges, 
especially with regard to their family relationships and their personal health. Lord, we pray that you will draw close to them and help them to draw nearer to you. Speak to them and help them to hear. Enthuse them with the wonder of your love. So may joy and peace fill their hearts now and always. And we pray for peace in our own lives. We are anxious about so many things. We worry about our standard of living, the pace of life. We worry about what others think of us. Lord, save us from anxiety. Show us how to accept that your love for us is real and that nothing can separate us from it. Give us that internal peace which is untouched by the outer storms of life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving Father, we place our children and young people in your hands. We do not ask that you will shield them from difficulty, but that you will give them the strength to face it. We don't ask that you will protect them from making mistakes, but that they may learn from them. Not that their lives will be easy, but that they will deal with its challenges courageously. Lord, be with them when they're vulnerable. Protect them from lasting harm. Keep them always in your love. Let us take a moment to remember before Almighty God those of our friends and family who need a special measure of strength and comfort and healing at this time. We take a moment of quiet to hold them before God in our hearts. Those who are sick, those who are worried and troubled, the lonely, those who've lost loved ones, In darkness and in light, in trouble and in joy, help us, Heavenly Father, to trust your love, to serve your purposes, and to praise your name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand for the peace. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And, and also with you. you. And let us offer one another a sign of peace. Our offertory hymn is number 281, I lift my eyes to the quiet hills.
things come from you, O Lord, and of your own have we given you. Amen. In the booklets, we now turn to page 18, or if you prefer the other numbering, it's 184. The lower number is 18, obviously. <coughs> the Lord be with you. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We give thanks to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. <coughs> it is indeed right, it is our duty and our joy at all times and in all places, to give you thanks and praise. Holy Father, Heavenly King, Almighty and Eternal God, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. For he is your living word, through him you have created all things from the beginning, and formed us in your own image. To you, to you be glory and praise forever. Through him you have freed us from the slavery of sin, giving him to be born of a woman and to die upon the cross. You raised him from the dead and exalted him to your right hand on high. To you be glory and praise for heaven. Through him you have sent upon us your holy and life-giving spirit and made us a people for your own possession. To you be glory and praise for heaven. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Accept our praises, Heavenly Father, through your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. And as we follow his example and obey his command, grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us his body and his blood, who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. To you be glory and praise forever. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which he shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Therefore, Heavenly Father, we remember his offering of himself made once for all upon the cross. We proclaim his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension. We look for the coming of your kingdom. And with this bread and this cup, we make memorial of Christ, your Son, our Lord. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Accept through him, our great High Priest, this our sacrifice of thanks and praise, and as we eat and drink these holy gifts in the presence of your Divine Majesty, renew us by your Spirit, inspire us with your love, and unite us in the body of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. To you be glory and praise forever. Through him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, with all who stand before you in earth and heaven, we worship you, Father Almighty, in songs of everlasting praise. Blessing and honour and glory and power be yours forever and ever. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
to share in the body of Christ. Now we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Jesus, bear our sins, have mercy on us. Jesus, Redeemer of the world, grant us peace. Continuing on page 14. Draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ which he gave for you and his blood which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. And we pray together. We do, we do not, not presume to come to this your table, O merciful Lord, Trusting in our own righteousness, as we can all manifold and great blessings, we are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs of your table. But you are the same Lord, whose nature is always our mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body. And our souls also in his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. The body of Christ keep you in eternal life. Amen. The body of Christ keep you in eternal life. Amen. The body of Christ keep you in eternal life. The body of Christ keep you in eternal life. I need to shed for you.
I just pray. <clears throat> On page 16, we shall say the second prayer. Father of all, we give you the thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We who the Spirit likes give life to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us, so we and all your children shall be already free. And the whole world live to praise your name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. We now sing our concluding hymn, hymn 445. Give you grace to grow in holiness, to deny yourselves, take up your cross and follow him. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.